uh, because we've got former British and WBU champion Michael Jennings on the line. How are you this evening, Mike? Yeah, good, thanks, mate. Good. Excellent stuff. We're just talking a bit of Roy Jones Jr. Hopefully he's retired after the weekend. You, were you a fan? Any favourite Roy Jones moments? Yeah, he was brilliant, weren't he? I think most boxers that have ever heard of or seen anything of him are going to be a fan of him. Do a bit of anything. You know, he was... Uh, he was fancy, but he could also he could back it up. He had punch power, speed, and he could box and fight. He was a top fighter. He certainly was a top fighter. Just bringing things a little closer to home, we spoke to British Cruiserweight champion Matty Askin on last week's show. You, of course, yeah. train Matty. How, how pleased are you with Matty's performances and progress at the moment? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're pleased with Matt, uh, Matty's come on because, obviously, before he came to us, he was on the verge of retiring. So, you know, no one gave him a a cat and else chance to do anything and you know to do what he's done to go on and win the British title and then hopefully defend it against Stephen Simmons on 17th of March I think he's come on a ton You obviously fought for the British title yourself during your career winning it against Chris Saunders yeah. I remember you fighting the likes of Jimmy Vincent Bradley Price what does it mean to fight and defend that belt? Um, yeah I mean to be fair when I was fighting it I didn't look at each I just Looked at each fight. I just wanted to win each fight. weren't There weren't a belt that I wanted to actually win, but obviously when I had, when I got the belt in my hands, it was you could see. You know, it's a prestigious belt and and one that most British boxers do want to hold, hold and on at some point. So yeah, it was made up something for the kids to be proud of, really. And obviously you went on as well for your most famous fight, probably February 2009. You challenged Miguel Cotto for the vacant WBO welterweight title. It was on HBO pay-per-view. There was 10,000 packed inside the garden. Cotto was on point that night, Michael, you know, especially to the body. What, what do you remember about that fight? Yeah, I remember all the fight. Um, obviously, I, I think I bought the wrong fight. You know, we had the game plan all wrong. And sometimes when you work on your back foot trying to get away from the punches, uh, from the punches power sort of thing it can work against you because you know it gives them more leverage and I think that's what I did I think if I'd have got up close I think I would have had a better chance against Cotto but to be fair you know the level that I boxed beforehand and when you get in with someone like Cotto you realise you know what makes them so good and so special What what exactly were those things was it the speed the power the way he cut the ring off Yeah it was, no it was his uh, it was his timing and his accuracy to be honest with you speed and power you know, I probably could have dealt with, but it was his, it was his accuracy and, and timing. Um, it's like when he hit me with the body shot, he hit me with the left up to the body, and and, and I went down and took an eight count on one knee. Um, while I was down there, I was thinking, there's no chance he's going to hit me again with that same shot, and, and he did, you know, with, him, with precision sort of thing, within a pinpoint, he caught me again with the same shot, and he's more or less the exact same place, and it's things like that what, you know, you, it's hard to explain, but it's that, it's that what's makes them stand out to the top fighters. Um, just remind our listeners, we have Michael Jennings on the call, a uh, top former professional, now a trainer. We're going to ask uh, some of the panel members in a minute if they want to come in and ask any questions. Just before we do yeah. so, what was the atmosphere like in there that night with all those Puerto Ricans baying for your blood? Um, again, it's like, see, it, was, it, was, it was hostile, but I don't remember it being hostile. It's like, I, a big thing for me when I was fighting it was my ring entrance music and it always got me up for it sort of thing. Mm. So no matter where I was or who I was up against, it didn't matter at that time. But I, when I have watched it back and, you know, it was very hostile, my missus just said then she remembers it being very hostile yeah. as well. But I don't actually remember it being like that. And uh, your final fight was obviously in September 2010 against the 21-0 and fighter for the British title, uh, Kel Brook. What was it like to fight yeah. Kel? What did he do so well? Um, to be fair, um, I thought I was coming, but I thought I was. I thought he won the first two, and I thought I won the next three. I was getting into that fight. I could hear, obviously, through with experience, I could hear Kel, you know, how he was breathing a lot more heavier and stuff like that, and he can't move an elbow. What well, well, got, you know, the referee used it as a punch, and if that's what he said, it was a punch, a punch, and it was a cut, what caught me. But apart from, from that, at that time, he wasn't the fighter that he is now, you know, because every credit to him, he's, he's gone on and he, he's done really, really well. He's, you know, fair play to him, he's a top, top class fighter. But at the time when I boxed him, he, I don't he, there was, he was my level sort of thing at that time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, it was just one of them things. I've been in with harder punchers. He had good variety. That's what, that's one thing that he did have. He, you know, he picked, he picked his shots well and 
and there was a lot of variety in body head shots, which which made the the harder shots more of a surprise. What what probably hurt you more? Who would be some of the more harder punches you went in with over your career? Um, <laughs> believe it or not, I got it once off Paul Denton, the journeyman. I don't even know even yeah, remember yes, him. Yes, I do. Yes, one in Obin Obs, he could punch. <laughs> Um, and his brother as well, Ramsey, Mark Ramsey. They, they, these sort, they, these sort of journeymen, they don't exist anymore. I don't think they, these were proper journeymen at the time, and they, and they give anyone problems. They could, they could actually punch, and I tell you, he could punch a little bit as well. Badly Price, mm. he could punch. Yeah, he could punch. He was quite strong, but obviously the, the best fighter I've been in with by by country mile, power, speed, accuracy, timing was Cotto. He, he, everything that he had just stood out compared to everyone else. I remember talking to Demarcus Corley a few years ago, and he said the thing was about Cotto as well was he was very sneaky with the old the head and the elbows away from the referee. Did you get any of that? Yeah, definitely. Once he was good at all that sort of thing, you know what I mean. And end of the day, it's all part and parcel of boxing. You know, we teach that sort of thing because if you can get away with it, fair play. Because Cotto got away with a lot. I mean, I remember the referee. Just before the fight, warning Cotto on no knees, not to use his knees because he was known for for kneeing on the inside. Yeah, you know, which is something what you wouldn't expect in boxing, but you know, you do get it. You get knees, you get elbows, you get shoulders, heads. You, you get quite, you get you get arms locked up and you know pushed against your elbows and stuff like that. All these little little uh, dirty moves, what no one expects happens in boxing, but because he covered it up well, you know, people do do it and get away with it. Yeah, as a professional fighter, just getting your point of view on this, you prepare diligently, obviously, for a fight, and you think you know what yeah. to expect from an opponent. What happens when the yeah. guy comes in and he's, say, a lot faster of hand than you thought he was going to be, or he punches a lot harder than you thought he would? How do you mentally adapt to that? Um, to be fair, I mean, when you look at my record, I, I, a lot of the kids that I boxed on my way up, they would. You know, there was journeymen, if I'm being honest with you. And, you know, most of my fights that I did, did actually win. I, I won by miles. You know, there was, they weren't really that close. I'll tell you who did surprise me more than anyone. And I think it was probably my own doing, like you said about the training, the diligent training and all the rest of it. I think I overtrained is when I boxed, um, what's he called, Young Mutley? Young Mutley, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he surprised me, but... Again, I think it was more more of my own. I overtrained in that fight, and from the first round, I, f I just felt completely drained. But yeah, he, he was good. He was he was slippery. And he was not bad counter punching. And do you know what? He could punch as well. He was quite strong. Yeah, he was a good fighter. So, yeah, he was a good fighter yeah, back yeah, in the day. I remember he was on ITV that one. I think. Yeah, I think it was. It was in um, Nottingham. I think it was the Ice Arena or something like that. But yeah, Mott was a good fighter, and I remember him. I remember watching him before that. You know, before I even knew I was fighting him, I thought, yeah, he's a decent kid. And he was, to be fair. Um, do any of our guys want to jump in? Ozzy, one of our contributors, I'm sure you've got a question for Michael. Yeah, Mike. Um, just tell us a little bit. Obviously, you you hung the gloves up and you've gone into training now. Tell us a bit about the fighters that you you look after. And obviously, I'll give one away, but you've got Jack Armfield going into a huge fight next week. How's the preparation gone for that? Well, it's funny you said that because it was only it was yesterday I was speaking to our dad, my brother who helps us to train, and uh, we were saying Jack's probably the well, not probably Jack's the best. While he's been at our gym, this is the best that I've seen him, and I'm not just saying that because it's this camp or anything. I'll tell you the truth. I mean, last time he boxed, he boxed um, Jones, and he had a terrible fight, and to get up for the fight, so, and I think he's. I think he was a bit stale in the gym and stuff like that, but this is definitely the best I've seen Jack Jack Armfield and well, he's the best that he's been sort of thing and he's, he's improved so much. So yeah, well, I'm I'm made up with Jack at the minute. You know, I think we've got a good chance. Any more questions, Ozzy? What are the lads? Yeah, I was going to say, what are the lads have you got as well aside from Matty Askin? We say that again. What other lads have we got besides Matty Askin? Yep, yep. Yes. Yeah. yeah, well, obviously, we've got Jack Anfield, who's obviously fighting for the British title. We've got Matty Askin, who's British champion. He'll be defending his British title on the 17th of March. And we've got Scott Fitzgerald, uh, Commonwealth gold medalist as an amateur. He's had um, had nine, one, nine, stop seven fights with Eddie Earn. He's fighting on Sunday, the 25th of February, 
in Manchester on the Next Generation show, and then he's looking. Well, I think he's out again in April on the on the Khan show, fighting for a title. We're not too sure on what title that is yet, but he's fighting for his first title on that. And then we've got Adam Little uh, from Black, another Blackpool kid, who I think you know Adam's been overlooked. He got beat off Glen Foot, but. I'd love, I'd love for Adam to get that fight again at some point, you know, just to show how much he's, he's improved. He's only had one fight with us, and that was on the WBS series. It was in Liverpool, and he won, he won a, an unbeaten kid, uh, Reese McMillan, I think he was called. He won him, in, he stopped him in the fourth round. So I've got high hopes for Adam. I think he could do well. And then we've got uh, Mark Jeffers, who's just turned twenty actually yesterday. He's six and all. Um, middleweight, but he's still growing. Mark, he's going to probably end up super middle, maybe light heavy. He's, he's big. He's going to be a big lad. You've got high hopes for Mark as well. He's, I think he's, you know, once his strength develops as a as a man, I think he, I think he'll be a force to be reckoned with. And just finally, for me, obviously, when you decided to go into the pro game, could you imagine it have gone any better for you? Obviously, when you first took over, it was you had to get the fighters in. But since then, it's really it's only gone up for you, hasn't it? Yeah, like well, I mean, we first opened, when we first opened, what happened when I got into training? My brother was doing a white collar and unlicensed boxing show, and I said I'd help him to train. So I'd, I'd done a bit of training with him, and then a couple more of his mates wanted to out wanted, wanted some training, so I started doing bits with them, and then. Um, we got, I got talked to my brother and we decided to open a, an amateur boxing gym. So we got we, op- we opened the gym, got the gym affiliated, you know, and was going down the amateur route at first. And what we want to do is obviously get the kids from being youngsters and train them all the way up to seniors and then hopefully turn them over to professionals as well. So, you know, we like a convert about really from amateurs to pro. But I bumped into Matty Askin one day and just asked him what he was up to and he was saying he's not really doing anything, not training or anything anymore, he's packing up and I told him that I'd got a gym and uh, asked him if he wanted to come down and he did come down and Matt, it was our first pro and it's just snowball effect from there really, so we're doing pretty well and the, good, the best thing about it is we're doing well with lads what have been written off which is what I'm I'm happy about because it, you know, it just goes to show that we must be doing something right because these lads was on the verge of retiring before, like Jack Armfield, he was on the verge of retiring. You know, he's most of the fights that he's been in while he's been with us, he's been a massive underdog and, and come out the winner. So, you know, I think it just shows that we must be doing something right. Certainly are. Thanks for the questions, Ozzy. Just a couple more questions, Michael. We do appreciate your time this Sunday evening. Um, we've had Jimmy Lee has been on the Twitter page asking us a question. He said, "Ask Michael, how hard was it to hang up the gloves after so many years boxing professionally?" Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't hang up the gloves through my. I did, it's not a decision that I wanted to do. Um, it, I had to do it because my shoulders went. My shoulders went knackered. Um, if my shoulders were still working, I would never have retired when I did. So that was the hardest part about it, you know, because it weren't my own, it weren't my own decision. So yeah, it was, it was horrible because from being thirteen up until being thirty two or thirty three, I had more or less similar sort of routine. It was just boxing, boxing day in day out for me from being a kid. So when I did actually pack up, there was a massive gap, big void there, and a, you know you don't know what to do with yourself. You get, you know, there's times when you're down and stuff like that, but. Just got to try and get on and, you know, just get through it. There's other things as well. Uh, Second question from Jimmy. He said, how are you enjoying training Chorley CC on Saturday mornings? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to be fair, it's my brother who does a, does a cricket cricket uh, cricket team. But yeah, and I, I did come up actually and train them last week with Matty Askin. And they, they, all, they, all, yeah, they all got stuck in, fair play to the lads. Yeah, they all got stuck in. If it's going to help them to win more games, then, you know, we're, we're willing to help them, definitely. And uh, just final question from me. Uh, just tell the listeners, don't forget to follow you over on Twitter at MikeJennings01. Tell us about your trainer back in the day, Michael, a guy called Brian Hughes. Some of our younger listeners might not be aware of Brian and his work, but he was a master of the boxing game. Yeah, Brian was good. Um, Brian was good at getting things across to you. That was, that was Brian's best aspect, I think he... You know the way that he he couldn't 
actually show you physically some things, but the way you explain it, you know exactly what it meant. And and that's what I want to be good at. You know, I think it's just breaking things down and so anyone can understand what you're trying to tell them, whether they're advanced in boxing or whether it's a kid that just walked through the door. You know, and it, it, obviously the easier it is for you to pick up, the easier it is you're going to get it sort of thing. And, and that's what Brian was good at. And the making you calm and all that, his stories and everything. It's hard to explain, really. It was, it, Brian was really good. He was a good man and a good trainer. And not giving the lads too many instructions all in one go, which sometimes you do here in between rounds, don't you? Yeah, it's silly. I mean, we get a lot of experience because obviously we're doing it with the amateurs and the pros, so we're in the corners quite a lot, do you know what I mean? And I think you just stick to your basics. Like, when when Matt is fighting and Jack and all that, nine times out of the ten, with the fight that they're having, we go over it a million times at the gym anyway, so... They know what we want to. They know what we want them to do. So basically, like it's like with Jack next week, we might be saying to him, you know, just imagine you're back in them circles in the gym. He'll know exactly what I mean by that. And and then once I've finished telling him the instructions, I'll ask him what I mean, and just to make sure that he has picked it up and understood it. Brilliant stuff, Michael. We really appreciate you coming on this evening. Thanks for giving us your time. No worries. Cheers for having us. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Same, uh, see you later, pal. Okay. See ya.